It's the day before my birthday, and I'm sprawled on a folding chair under the beautiful Oaxacan sun, sweating out a low-grade fever and fighting back tears. I'm doing my best to silently project my woefulness through sad sniffles to my partner Q and our friend Khan, who are doing their best to pretend I don't exist. Shitty, right? But I can't blame them after I hijacked my own birthday getaway. I don't think my travel companions fully realize exactly what I meant by get away and how miserably I was failing at escaping. How could they when I didn't even know? Six months before, when my breakdown in Oaxaca was just a twitch in my eye, my mom called to tell me what her doctor finally figured out after a month of phone tag, testing, and staying off WebMD. Stage four. I felt my stomach drop. 10 years, she continued. Alex Trebek had the same kind and lived for 10 years. I can do that? Shit, I'm younger than him. I got a fight ahead of me, Jor. Okay, mama, I mirrored the grit in her tone. Let's do it, I'll come up for the first treatment. I got you. Ever the middle child, I went into peacekeeping mode, hurling myself at the opportunity to stand between my mom and her prognosis. We talked about a plan, treatment, clearing schedules. She joked about finally taking time off from work. And that's when I knew she was scared because I learned from her how to laugh through discomfort. She kept joking through the chemo and the surgeries and the non-committal answers from doctors. And she did fight as hard as she could, but we did not get 10 years. In just a couple of months, she was gone. Two hazy months after that, I decided to be far away from anyone giving me that specific, I'm sorry your mom died and now it's your birthday, forearm squeeze. They could text me instead. My abuelita suggests Mexico City like the trip she and my mom took a couple years ago. I float the idea to Q, who suggests looping in our friend Khan, obviously because Khan has recently gone to Mexico City and not at all because they are a licensed therapist and <laughs> this impulsive trip is wildly out of character. <laughs> Typically, I'm what I call a type A minus <laughs> who would shudder at some of the logistical decisions I was letting slide, whereas Q and Khan are both babies of the family who probably grew up thinking, oh, everything will work out as their older siblings were frantically pulling strings to, in fact, make it work out. But for this trip, I was chill, nothing to worry about, totally fine. See, I have a secret secondary plan. Based on my research, years of pop culture consumption, I knew that a capital T trip was the most efficient way to get to profound healing. Flights and housing booked, loving partner and therapist friend on call, and a little journal for grief observations packed. I'm ready to have my eat, sob, grieve journey. <laughs> I passed the months leading up to the trip, envisioning myself speed running through all the stages of grief right into the open arms of acceptance. The week of my birthday approaches and Q, Khan, and I embark to Mexico. Through every missed ride to the airport and nearly missed flight, a sense of loneliness gnaws at me. We breeze through museum tours and cafe feasts and pose for pictures next to waterfalls, but I feel myself withdrawing, becoming small under the paradoxical weight of something missing, the lack. Q and Khan, loving partner and therapist friend that they are, notice. Are you okay? I'm fine. Is there something else you want to do? Nope, this is good. Khan wants to know if they did something to upset you. Q brings up. Their tone is gentle. I want to scream. No, it's not about them, I say. I feel like a cheap imitation of my mom when she's stubbornly refusing help. To Q's worried face, though, I concede. I'm just tired, I think. Q and Khan continue to share concerned looks as the first half of the trip wears on. And I do really feel exhausted from packed days and sleepless nights, 
or at least that's what I tell myself with each increasingly stilted interaction between us. But we rally for our last night in Mexico City. We meet up with some local friends Con knows from their prior trip. The four people we find gathered at a table in a chic bar are cool, queer, a breath of fresh air. I tuck myself in the corner of the table, happy to listen to the biggest personality who goes by the nickname Pollo, very cool, <laughs> regaling us with tales of growing up in Mexico City. Pollo then asks about San Diego and my work with research grants. Pollo leans in. So, do you do anything with clinical trials? Yeah, my team works with the departments that manage clinical trials, I cautiously offer. Okay, so let me tell you, man. Pollo settles back in their chair, getting ready to launch into another story. I start to relax. This isn't about me or my mom or one more person asking if I'm okay. And then Pollo tells us a story about their dad and his cancer, his nearly identical prognosis to my mom's. So then we were like, fuck this, and we brought him back to Mexico, and the doctors just did a couple surgeries. Pollo shrugs. Everything feels overwhelming. The corner now too loud, too small, too crowded. Pollo finishes. And that was a few years ago, and he's totally fine now. Those American doctors don't know what they are doing. I nod again in disbelief, sitting here in an unfamiliar city, hearing an all too familiar story, but Pollo's dad gets the Hollywood ending. The conversation moves on, but I tap Q in a request to escape to the bathroom. Alone, I try to quiet the outrage bubbling up, echoing the doubt that has been following me for months. Could we have kept her around for longer, for the 10 years she set out to live? I feel the hot press of angry tears at the apathy of the universe. The rest of the night passes in a blur. Poyo's alternate universe cancer parent story was definitely not in the itinerary. I wake up the next morning with a scratchy throat. My body's way of letting me know that actually this grief would find a way out on its own schedule. My profound healing itinerary be damned. After another harrowing trip to the airport, Q, Khan, and I fly out to Oaxaca to finish out the trip. The noxious mix of mucus, exhaustion, and despair hinder my ability to plaster a smile on my face. At this point, Q and Khan have lost some patience with my whole quietly suffering but won't ask for help vibe. There is a heavy implication that I am not allowed to be a party pooper on my own birthday trip. I unfortunately continue to fail the vibe check in Oaxaca. My allergies get harder to ignore and I retreat into myself. I know that the pressure from holding everything in has literally turned into a sinus headache, but I'm so afraid to loosen my grip on all these feelings. If I release any of it, I feel like I'll somehow lose my mum all over again. Q, Khan, and I reach a tenuous agreement to visit the famous, peaceful Oaxacan Botanical Garden on the day before my birthday. We shuffle into the courtyard, finding a place in the rows of folding chairs. Q and Khan giggle amicably with each other, bodies angled away from me. The minutes pass agonizingly slowly under the sun. It's fine, I'm fine. Before long, though, I feel tears forming and a headache begins to throb at my temples from all the pent-up pressure and burgeoning fever. I finally give up and bury my head in my hands in defeat and accept that this will go down as the worst birthday. I miss my mom. I can't ask her to retell my birth story just to hear her laugh about how I was born two weeks late because I loved her so much but she had me evicted with a vacuum. <laughs> Despite how often I would hold her at arm's length, my mom was always so proud to remind me that I would always be hers. Excuse me, is this seat taken? An older woman smiles politely down at me from above my pools of fluids and self-pity. No, sorry, let me clear my stuff. I discreetly scoot the seat next to me further away from my birthday breakdown. She settles in, and I wait for her to take out her phone, chanting in my head, please leave me alone, please 
leave me alone. I'm so excited for this tour. Have you been waiting long? She asks. I eye her suspiciously. The last chat with a stranger on this trip did not go well. No, not really, I politely reply. But instead of letting our conversation die, this woman coaxes me into engaging in one of my worst anxieties, small talk. <laughs> As we chat, I realize three things. She thinks I'm a fellow solo traveler. She's the first person to speak to me in the last hour. And she reminds me of my mom who would always strike up conversations with others to help pass the time in those purgatory-like public states of waiting with strangers. By the end, my mom would have the people joining in with her silly joking. Being a painfully shy kid, I resented how she wrote me into these interactions. The woman in Oaxaca chatters on, and I'm struck by the memory of my last trip to the park with my mom a week before she passed her uneaten frozen yogurt melting in the August sun as she sat in my abuelita's walker. Are you going to be okay without your mom? So young, my mom asked me, paused and quietly added, I don't wanna be forgotten, with a heartbreaking mixture of fear and sadness on her face. Of course we'll remember you, mom, I promise. It was all the comfort I could offer her. I'm pulled back to the present when the tour guide announces the start, directing the group to follow him. Well, I hope you enjoy the garden. My waiting area guardian angel calls out with a parting wave. I give her a watery smile as the tears begin in earnest, wondering how many strangers my mom made smile with similar fleeting kindness. Thankfully, I'm hidden behind some sunglasses, so I don't ruin this woman's love of small talk by making her spend the rest of the two-hour tour wondering what she said that sent me sobbing. <laughs> the next morning, on my birthday, I wake up too early and still sick, but my grip on my grief is looser. Since my mom passed, I started out wholly unprepared for the acute kind of grief that can only come from losing the person who most embodied home for me. But as I lay there, nose clogged, mouth breathing, and a year older, I could feel some of the sharpness of the pain soften, a reminder of the love that had formed it. Our flight home is still chaotic, and our ride to the airport does bail. The universe is wholly indifferent, after all. But I had an answer from my mom now. It would be OK. It would have to be and she would never be forgotten. Today, it's been one year since losing her. Her presence in my life looks a lot different now. Sometimes it's replaying the videos I have of her wheezing asthma laugh. It also looks like leaning on those offering to help. It may even be standing in front of a bar full of people sharing in the memory of my mom, Julie. <laughs> Jory Moore, ladies and gentlemen, Jory Moore.